We'll get to Psalm 96 in a minute. That's where we're going to start reading. Um, until then, the scriptures we're going to look at are in your notes. So go ahead and look at your notes. The title of the sermon is, I Believe I Should Always Respond with Worship. Help me become a daily worshiper of God. And, and if I just said, hey, do you agree with that? Uh, I should always respond to God with worship. We would all say yes. And, and we would feel good about our answer. And we would really probably... Uh, think we're doing that, and some of us may be doing that. But a lot of people hear the word worship and they think of Sunday morning worship service, what we've just done, what we're doing now, and we think that we come to church to worship. And, and so then we say daily worshiper of God, that opens, opens up questions. What does that mean to daily worship? Are we going to come to church every day? Uh, how's this going to work? So, so that's our topic today. We're going to be looking at worship for a few Sundays, and I want to start with this, this idea that we find in number one in your notes, the word ascribe. I don't use the word ascribe in my daily life. I don't think I've ever walked up to anyone and in, in a normal sentence used the word ascribe. So when I read that in scripture, I have to go look it up, see what it means in order to gain an understanding. And when I, when I gain the understanding, then I, then I have a clear understanding of what I'm being taught or instructed to. So the word ascribe, and I'm giving you an easy definition, is to give credit where credit is due. To give credit where credit is due. So when I ascribe unto God, I'm giving God credit for what God has done. And, and we're going to transition to the word worship. Eventually, I'll start saying worship. And I'll stop saying ascribe because ascribe has, has a more limited application. Worship has a broader application. But to give God credit where credit is due is worship. That, that's, that's an easy definition that, that works in almost all circumstances. And, and we can look at our life and say, am I worshiping God? By answering the question, am I giving God credit? where credit's due. And since I live a daily life in the presence of God, and I serve God daily, and I interact with God daily, and his instructions interact with me daily, then how I respond in giving God credit is worship. And that's what we're going to start with in our study of worship. So in your notes, you have First Chronicles 16.28, and then right below it, the next verse, 16.29. And this is what I read this morning at the beginning of the service. It says, ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. So this simply says, give credit to God for his glory and strength. So where do we see his glory and where do we see his strength? Well, whenever we see his glory, whenever he sees his strength, we worship him by acknowledging it, by, by saying it out loud, by pointing it out. So we worship God by identifying and acknowledging his glory and strength. Verse 29, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name, bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. So we, we give credit to God when we bring an offering. We're literally saying to God, this is for you because of all you've done. I am able to give to you because you have abundantly given to me. I'm putting my faith in you to keep your promises, and, and I'm showing you this by giving you from the beginning, the first fruits, and not at the end. I'm not giving you what's left. I'm giving you from the front, trusting you to provide in the end. So we worship or ascribe to God the glory to his name by bringing an offering and then by looking at his holiness, who God is. So I will worship God because of who he is. I will show my worship by bringing an offering. Psalm 29, 1 and 2 says, Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Those are, that's the exact same thing we read in Chronicles. It, it's there multiple times. You can find it more than just that. And, and I, I like to say that God doesn't stutter or repeat himself without a reason. He didn't forget he said it and thought of it again and said, oh, I better put that in there. He said it twice because he wants us to hear it twice. He wants us to consider it and to listen to it. And he's really calling us to worship him. 
calling us to give him credit. Now to Psalm 96. In your notes, you have verse 7 and 8. I actually want to read the entire psalm to you, and then we'll come back and look at 7 and 8. So Psalm 96, starting with verse 1. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. That's a small g there. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are his sanctuary, are in his sanctuary. Verse 7. Ascribe to the Lord, all ye families and nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. So it says, ascribe to the Lord all ye families and nations. Sounds very familiar. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Sounds very familiar. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Again, it's, it's repeat. It says, bring an offering. We've already heard that. And then it says, come into his courts. So one of the ways we give God credit for who he is and what he's done is by coming together. So simply by coming together this morning as, as the church that meets at Heritage Bible Church's facility, for us coming together as a family, simply being here is worship. And I hope you're seeing that there's so many elements of worship, we're going to talk about many of them, that have nothing to do with singing. Now this scripture talked a lot about singing, but other things came about too. So we're going to, we're going to give God credit for his glory and his strength, for his holiness, um, and we're going to come together and we're going to bring an offering. These are things we do. So in your notes, to ascribe unto God the glory to his name, is to verbally acknowledge who God is. Verbally. So I'm going to speak it. I'm going to sing it. I'm going to pray it. I'm going to proclaim it. I'm going to praise it. I'm going to verbally acknowledge who God is and then physically respond to what we have said. I'm going to physically respond. That's, that's the offering. That's coming together. And there's many more ways. I just wanted enough scripture to make the point here. To ascribe unto God is both verbal and physical. So my physical life is, can be worship. My verbal life can be worship. And they should go together. They should match. And in these scriptures, we have speech offerings and coming into his courts. So plant that thought in your mind. Let's go to number two. And let's read 1 Corinthians 10, 31. It says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do it all for the glory of God. Give God credit. That's what it means to, to the glory of God. Give God credit. That means to ascribe. So it says whether you're eating or drinking, the most mundane things there are to do, whether you're eating or drinking or whatever you do, and so you would ask, what do I do? So whether I go to work or stay home, whether I'm hanging out with friends or whether I'm by myself, whether I'm studying, whether I'm reading, whether I'm listening to music, whether I'm driving, whether I'm taking care of my family, no matter what I do, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do from the mundane to the important, do it for the glory of God. Do it in such a way that gives God credit. So now we have to start thinking, how can I do this thing so that God receives glory. Because I am to worship in response to him all the time, everywhere. And I can, I can do things in a way that gives God glory. 
And I can do things in a way that does not give God glory. So I'm going to ask the question. And then Romans 12, 1 says, Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Uh, living sacrifice can be a lot of things, but it's always all in. There was never a sacrifice that only offered a hind leg, or a right ear, or a left eyeball. It was all in. And, and for us to be a living sacrifice, that means while we're still here, we're to be all in. All in for, for Jesus. And so whatever that living sacrifice looks like, that, that is our true and proper worship. So by being the sacrifice, by being who God wants me to be, I'm worshiping. So that opens, opens an, another avenue there. So in your notes, if our actions and our attitudes can bring glory to God, then they are part of our worship. So our actions and our attitudes are part of our worship. So we ascribe unto the Lord the glory to his name, and then our actions and our attitudes back that up, and they become part of our worship. So big idea number one, worship takes place not only at church, but also in our homes. Worship takes place in your home, at our jobs, takes place at my workplace, in our interactions, how I relate to each other, within my attitudes and my motives and my responses. Worship can take place in my mind, all right? It takes place in my obedience, whether I'm going to listen to God and obey. Obedience is an act of worship. And my spiritual investment. When I'm investing in, in, in my spiritual development, that's worship. So worship takes place all over the place in many different ways, in many different contexts. Worship is not only a Sunday thing, it's a daily thing. And so if we're going to spend two or three weeks talking about worship, we need to understand that, that worship is something that happens all the time. It's, it's at your home. It's in your car. It's at your job. It's at the park. It's at Little League. It's at club meeting. It's, it's, it's everywhere I go. I can be worshiping God. And then when we think about who God is and what he's done, the promises he's made, the provision he's given, the salvation he has achieved for us, when we think about all these things, we should respond in worship. And if worship is a daily thing, then we should respond daily to that truth. So my worship is that interaction with God. I want to take that a little bit deeper, and, and I want to do the backside of our notes, and I want to talk about these four things so I, I found an article, and, and I'll give credit here, BibleConnection.com, an article called Four Spiritual Types of Worship, and, and this was where I started from. And when we say worship, it's ascribing to God the glory to his name. It's giving credit to God for what he's done. And so worship and ascribing, worship and giving credit, worship is reacting to God so that he receives glory. How do we do that? Well, number one, is grateful submission to God. Grateful submission to God. What I liked about this article was that they started off by saying there's lots of words in Scripture that can be translated worship. There's lots of words in the original language that can be translated worship or indicate worship. And, and, and they categorized them. And they, they kind of narrowed it down into four categories. So these are categories of worship. So when I submit to God, I'm worshiping. When I gratefully submit to God, I'm worshiping to the second power. Or I'm, I'm worshiping at a new level. So this submission, the words that, that fit this category that they're calling submission, grateful submission to God, the illustration is bowing down. Bowing down. Okay? So in Revelation 22, 8 and 9... Let me read this to you. It says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and when I had heard and seen them, I fell down, bowing down, fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of the scroll. Worship God. So John fell down as an act of worship. The angel recognized his falling down or bowing down as an act of worship. 
The angel said, no, you can't worship me. You only worship God. So there was a, a physical bowing down in this circumstance that was an indication of worship. I'm going to read you Joshua chapter 5, 13 through 15. And it says, Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down on the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for you, his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. When Joshua recognized this was God speaking to him, he fell down on his face and worshipped. So that's not really part of our culture. We don't, we don't bow to really anybody. You know, in some cultures, it's still a thing. You enter a room and you bow to show respect. You bow to show you're at a position higher than mine. It's not part of our culture. But we can still bow in our spirit and we can bow in our attitude. Okay? So this type of worship, this submitting or bowing, communicates a dependence on God, an acknowledgement of his greatness, and our submission to his will. So when I pray... Even if I'm standing up here praying, spiritually and mentally, I am, I am bowing. I come before God, and, and I have an attitude of, I am here as, as a very low person, coming before you as the highest entity to, to share my needs and my requests. And, and I'm humbled that you'll even listen, and if you respond... I'm going to be really grateful. And, and that's the attitude I come with. That's that submissive attitude. That bowing down attitude. And, and I acknowledge his greatness and, and submission. I, I realize that I'm not going to get anywhere without God. I'm not going to save myself. I'm not going to save my friends. I'm not going to make this life better on my own. I need God to do that. And so I bow before him as my source of strength and the only one who can accomplish things. I can do this, see, it can be accomplished in prayer, in singing, oration, obedience and attitude, and, and so many more things. But when I pray, we've talked about that, that's the attitude I'm coming to God with. When I sing, the things we've sung, praise the Father, praise the Son, uh, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, the, the things we've sung, we're saying to God, I depend on you. I need you. We're saying to God and to each other, I am, I am alive in Christ because Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He rose from the dead. He, he did all these things so that we could live, so that we could glorify God. So I can, I can do this in singing. I am orating, another word I never use. But I'm speaking. You might, you might be teaching. You might be lecturing your kids. You might be doing all kinds of stuff. And you can glorify God as you do that. When I obey God, I'm, I'm bowing in submission to his authority, to his instructions. And, and I'm worshiping him. And if my attitude is correct, it's another level of worship because I'm obeying because I love God. I'm obeying because I know he's on my side and he has my best interest in mind. So one of the ways we worship God daily is to daily submit to his rule and reign, if you will. The second one is service to others. And this really falls under the heading of obedience again. And you'll find these overlap tremendously. But service to others. In that, everything God has called us to do is usually directed towards others. Love one another as yourself. The fruits of the Spirit are towards others. We're often called, mostly, I don't, probably every time we're given an instruction, it has an element of thinking of those around us. Who's going to come after me? Who, who am I going to influence? Who am I going to impact? So it's about obedience. It's service to others. We're actually glorifying God by serving others. 
We see it in the Old Testament in a really interesting way in the sacrifices, rituals, and festivals. Rarely, if ever, did a person bring a sacrifice to the temple for himself and himself alone. The father or the grandfather would bring a sacrifice for his family, okay? And other individuals might bring a certain sacrifice for their clan or for their tribe or for their nation. And then the sacrifices and the rituals and the festivals were about bringing everyone together and, and being on the same team and, and serving as a nation and serving the nation. So as they worshiped in obedience, they were coming together and serving one another. It's a lot easier to see in the New Testament, go back to the living sacrifice. You're, you're still alive, but you're giving your all to God. And, and, and that always involves serving others, loving one another as yourself, keeping the commandments, using your spiritual gifts, which always go towards someone else. It's never to glorify yourself. It's always to help someone. And the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, those all go to other people. I'm patient with you. I'm loving you. I'm, I'm joyful in your presence. It, it's always outward motivated. So it's that service element. This worship communicates a change in me as a result of my relationship with God and his, his interaction in my life. It's, it's glorifying God. It's giving God credit for what he's done because it's a change because of God. So by me living according to his standards and, and these things being a part of my life, I'm putting on display what God has done, therefore glorifying God. C, uh, in your notes, this can be accomplished with righteous living, righteous interactions with others, service in the church, obedience, as well as godly attitudes and motives. It, it's a list very similar to number one. But as, as we do these things, we put God on display. I think in 1 Samuel 15, 22, we see this clearly. Uh, the context here is that Saul has gone out on his own and, and done the work of the prophet. And in doing so, he has disobeyed God's instruction. God told him to do something a certain way. And King Saul got tired of waiting for Samuel the prophet to show up and do it. And so he took upon himself to do, do it himself. He offered a sacrifice on his own instead of waiting for Samuel. So when this happens, Samuel shows up, and, and Saul is like, hey, I already did it. Isn't this great? And Samuel says, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? Is, 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 God, is God more excited about the sacrifice you did, the ritual you performed, or, or obeying? And he's really saying obeying is more important. You should have obeyed the Lord. If, if you couldn't do the sacrifice, you should have obeyed the Lord regardless. To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. To heed is to listen. So to listen and obey is better than the sacrifice or the religious acts of worship. So in serving others, we're obeying God. That Those go hand in hand. You really can't separate the two. In our service and obedience, we ascribe unto God the glory due his name by serving others. Number three, there's three words to fill in because there's no one word that, that covers it all. The three words are fear, reverence, and respect. Fear, reverence, and respect. If you describe what it means to fear God, you have to talk about reverence and respect and, and vice versa with all three words. It's illustrated in the heart attitude found in those verses. I'm going to read you Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 5.29. It says, Oh, that the hearts would be inclined to fear me. Okay, fear me. And keep all my commands always so that it might go well with them and their children forever. Fear me and keep my commands. See, they go hand in hand, right? Deuteronomy 6, 2 says, so that you, your children and their children after them may fear the Lord as long as you live in keeping my decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you, will, you may enjoy long life. To, to fear, to revere, to respect is, is to obey. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, this is 
Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, after living his life, really going nuts and crazy and trying all the things, said, I tried this and it didn't work. I tried this and it didn't work. I tried this and it didn't work. He tried everything that you've ever tried. And he's tried everything that the, the group together has tried. And in the end, he said, none of it worked except this. He says, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commands. Again, fearing God and keeping his commands going hand in hand. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. So we worship God by obeying him. This worship is communicated in our attitude towards God, and it is demonstrated in our obedience to his commands. So what is one of the reasons we obey God? Because in doing so, we are worshiping God. We are giving God glory in our obedience. So if I ever say to myself, well, I know what God wants, but I don't think I want to do that. I want to try something else. I want to try it my way. I think I have a better way than God's way. You are not only disobeying God, you are stealing worship from him. You are stealing the glory he will receive when you obey and when you do it his way. And it's important that, that, we, that we realize that. We are to fear God, not shake in the corner because we think God might be close by, but, but we have reverence for God and respect for God. And we know who he is and, yes, what he's capable of. And we join all that together and we say, this is a God that I want to obey and to follow. I want him on my team, not on some other team. And then see, this can be accomplished in almost every area of life. It would be the same list as in 1 and 2. It would be the same list, so there's no reason to repeat it. The number four is corporate interaction with God. Corporate means together. So corporate interaction with God is any and all the things we've already discussed that take place together as a family of God. So we come together as a family of God, we come together as a church, and we do all these things, and as we do it together, it's another layer of worship. So you showing up is worship, you participating is worship, us doing it together adds another layer of worship. Many voices praising God in the same song is a greater act of worship than a single voice. Now it doesn't negate the single voice, but it means we use the single voice when we're by ourselves, and then we come together to, to speak with a greater voice, so that God receives more glory, because in response to what he's done, we want him to be glorified. This is illustrated by the formation of the churches in Acts, the letters to the churches in Revelation, and in the leadership structure of the churches in Ephesians. God set up the church. There was no church in the Old Testament. There was a synagogue and there was a temple. And, and you went to the temple. We don't have to travel anywhere outside of our own little town here to come to church, to be together under the umbrella of God as, as a family. So God set up the church so that we could all come together all over the world on a regular basis and worship him. God organized a group of believers to worship together. And as we worship together, it's another layer of worship. This worship is communicated in corporate singing, prayer, fellowship, scripture reading, offering, and instruction. So these are all, you might wonder why we do the same thing every Sunday, why we include certain elements in the service. It's because in, in doing so, we're worshiping. We worship as we sing. We worship as we pray. We worship as we fellowship because we're obeying God's commands to interact with one another, to lift one another up, to spur one another on to, to love and good works, to love our neighbors ourselves. We're, we're worshiping God when we read scripture. We're worshiping God when we collect the offering. We're worshiping God when we receive instruction. You're actually worshiping God when you greet one another and shake hands. In Hebrews 10, 25, it says, Do not forsake the gathering together of the saints, as some are in the habit of doing. Now, some of you, and only you know who you are, go to bed Saturday night or wake up Sunday morning, and church is a total option. Eh, I don't think so today. Eh, I think I will today. Eh, we'll see how I feel in the morning. Well, breakfast was, took a little longer than I thought, so I think I'll just stay home. There's a really good football game on today. 
I think I need to watch the football game. Whatever the case may be, whatever the excuse may be, we're forsaking the gathering together of the saints. And why is that a big deal? Because you can listen to the sermon online. You can, you can watch other church services online. Why is it a big deal to actually be here? Because by being here together and participating in these corporate levels of worship, we are honoring God. We're ascribing to God the glory due his name. We're worshiping him. And in response to what he's done, he deserves our worship. So we should have the attitude that when I have a chance to get together with the family of God and worship him together, I'm going to take that opportunity. I'm not going to miss unless I absolutely have to. Because that's how important it is. Because my daily response to God should be worship. So the big idea at the bottom of the page, I believe I should always respond to God with worship. Help me become a daily worshiper of God. Help me to live right, think right, respond right. Help me to follow, help me to listen, help me to obey. Everywhere I go and everything I do, whether I eat or drink, whatever I do, help me worship God. And, and so maybe you haven't been aware of all these areas and ways we worship God. You can worship God with your attitude doing almost anything. And that's, that's how we need to look at it. That's how we need to view it. So this is our prayer today. We're going to say to God, I believe I should always respond to God in worship. And, and I think we can say that honestly. I don't think any of us would say, no, I don't think I should worship God. I don't think that's a good response. No one would say that. We all say we should worship God. The prayer is that this is incorporated daily in everything I do. In everything I do, I'm going to worship God. And it's going to look a lot of different ways. And, and, and it's going to come out in a lot of different ways. But if, if God is receiving glory, if God is getting the credit he deserves, then we are worshiping. And our goal is to worship. So we're going to pray this together as we have done through this series. We're going to pray this first line or two together, and then I will close. So let's pray this together. I believe I should always respond to God with worship. Help me become a daily worshiper of God. Well, Father, that is our goal. And it's, it's, sometimes it's easy to disconnect what you've done and, and how we should respond. Because you so willingly did it, and, and, and it didn't cost us anything. But now, in response, it should cost us something. We should always obey. We should always listen. We should always proclaim. We should always praise you. We should always worship you. And Father, in our daily lives, we can worship minute by minute, hour by hour, no matter where we're at or what we're doing. And I pray that we just develop that attitude that we are worshiping and we're going to worship. And so, Father, help us on a daily basis. You know far greater what, what we're trying to communicate here. And you deserve everything we can offer you. So, Father, we, we give it to you. Holy Spirit, help us realize opportunities to worship. Help us to follow through. Ask this in your son's name. Amen.